Hello and welcome to another AFCB TV preview show here at Vitality Stadium. Matchday commentator Chris Temple's back and we'll be talking everything AFC Bournemouth in the next half an hour or so. We're going to start back at last weekend and that 2-0 defeat in South Wales. Chris, it was a tough afternoon, wasn't it? Yeah, Eddie Howe described it as a really weird game. Um, you know, a, a lot of the ball, but just didn't really have the cutting edge. Obviously, it was a very emotional occasion as well. And there was, there was lots of things go going on around it. But, you know, on paper, off the back of the Chelsea result and the confidence and everything that that, that built, um, it just I think it was one that people probably didn't see coming. Just a, a bit of a sort of flat performance. You know, if Andrew Sermon had a, a shot tipped onto the bar at 1-0, that could have been a different afternoon if that goes in. You know, no doubt about the penalty early on either. Steve Cook with his, uh, his handball. So, yeah, I think all in all, it's one of those that you sort of look back at, I don't know, Newcastle games like that where things just didn't really happen and you, you can't really put your finger on why. So Eddie's has said, you know, in the advance of this game this weekend that they, they haven't really reflected too much on Cardiff because it was a little bit of a quirk in that it wasn't really Bournemouth. It was a sort of strange old day all round. So, uh, yeah, I think they're keen to move, but move on pretty quickly from that. And the timing of the goals didn't help either right at the start of the first half and right at the start of the second half as well. Yeah, exactly. When, at half time when you've, uh, you've mapped out how you need to improve and things and then you go and concede straight away. Uh, yeah, terrible timing from that point of view. You know, Cardiff had their game plan which I think you know I did not saying it caught Eddie on the hop but in terms of like it was a difficult one to deal with so um, yeah Cardiff play a unique way um, in the context of the table it was you know when you lose to a team down the bottom I think you'd always expect that to be a very emotionally charged day of course Cardiff will be fired up by the, the tragic news of Emiliano Sala of course as well so yeah I think that is one that goes into the draw line and, and move on pretty quickly book yeah and you mentioned Andrew Sermon hit the bar it was a really good save from Neil Etheridge and if that goes in at 1-0 then you never know what could happen from there yeah he's been a, he, Neil Etheridge has been a a good signing for Cardiff. He's, he's actually, um, you know, he's, he's kept him in a few games this season. I think you remember him having a quite a good game uh, here in the return um, fixture right at the start of the season. Um, so yeah, that, if that goes in, it's different, a different game. Andrew Sermon doesn't get many goals. Sometimes when he pops up, they're very important ones. So yeah, if that if that could have been a, a game changer potentially. But you know, Dominic Solanke, looking at the positives, he got, got on and got some match minutes, which I think he obviously needed. Um, you know, by all accounts, you know, drove the ball pretty well, held the ball up nicely, but was finding himself pretty deep at times. And the final third was a problem. So he'll only get better with match minutes um, and with Callum out for the next few weeks, then he'll probably get them. And you mentioned Callum was out. David Bricks was also missing. How much of a factor do you think that was? Probably the factor, to be honest. The way he played against Chelsea, the way he's been playing recently. You know, I, I would imagine Wales fans and Cardiff fans were probably a bit disappointed because obviously he's been uh, a factor in the Wales international team. They were probably quite liking the look of getting a, a close-up glimpse of what he can do. So, yeah, not, but not that Bournemouth fans particularly care about what Cardiff fans think. But, yeah, huge miss. Um, and he's going to be out for a few weeks. So, when you suddenly take Callum out of the team and then you take... You know, you're most, probably your most creative player out of the team as well. Um, then that obviously is not a not a great situation. Um, others, of course, can step up. It's a good chance for for Junior to come in. And now, you know, Ryan Fraser will have a bit more sort of, I guess, leaning on his shoulders to, to make things happen. But I guess it just it's a testament to David Brooks and what a good season he's had that you take him out and all of a sudden that having to look in other areas for for someone to spark things into action. And you mentioned that Chelsea game. That game just four days later, it was a real good opportunity to build some momentum, wasn't it? After the run they've been on. Yeah, and it's strange how it, it is a strange how a team can turn into sort of so different performances and I, again is there a mental factor you know you, you beat Chelsea 4-0 and you're riding the crest of a wave and all of a sudden Eddie you know shot this down that they got a bit carried away um, but it was just the inconsistency that's the thing it's amazing that a team can perform what is it three or four days apart in, in two completely different ways so they have to use that Chelsea result and, and performance in the right way and it will give them some confidence going to Liverpool because that is you know they have well, they trashed one of the best, basically. I was going to say they beat them, but they you know, they beat them up. So, um, you know, Liverpool haven't been firing on all cylinders. We'll talk about that in a, more in a moment. But, yeah, it is football is a funny old game that you can uh, you can suddenly see two different teams in the space of a few days. And, as you say, it was a very emotional afternoon, a very sombre afternoon. That would have been on the minds of everyone at Cardiff City, wouldn't it? Yeah, and, I mean, Bournemouth players will... You, you can't help sometimes and get sucked up into that sort of thing because you end up, you know, taking part in things that are not part of a normal match day. Um, you have to try and keep your mind and everything focused. That's the job of a, a footballer, whatever's going on outside, however much stick you're getting from the terrace or however much, you know, emotion there is around a, a certain occasion. Um, when the whistle goes, you've got to try and, um, you know, be on it. But sometimes you, you just can't... You cannot 
sometimes quantify how much those sort of things do get in your mind and do just, I guess, change your, your mental sort of side of the game. So, yeah, it was a, a very difficult afternoon, I think, for, for everybody connected with Cardiff. And, you know, you saw Neil Warnock's emotion at the end as well, what it, what it sort of meant overall, really. Absolutely. Well, at the Cardiff City Stadium last weekend, Steve Cook made his 300th appearance for AFC Bournemouth, and he's been speaking to AFC BTV this week to reflect on the milestone. Steve, some, uh, some very touching messages from uh, family, friends, ex-players, players. players. Um, any strike a real chord with you there? Yeah, obviously, um, my close mates, family. I don't even know why I feel emotional, it's weird. Um, obviously, my, my little boy at the end, Jaden. He's... <laughs> James Stockley is obviously an absolute nutter. Um, the one that obviously, <laughs> uh, yeah, he obviously makes me laugh a lot. And yeah, the, all of them, to be honest. Um, yeah, delighted with, with all the videos and really touching. The, the, the theme of a lot of the messages, Steve, is it's not been easy for you to get here. Just talk us through those sort of early days. Yeah, obviously it's, um, it's a very difficult journey to come on, uh, being a professional footballer. Um, from Martin Hinchwood, my my uh, <coughs> youth team uh, manager, I nailed it on at 15. I probably accepted that I wasn't going to be a footballer um, for one reason or another. So to sit here now playing 300 games for for Bournemouth um, and nearly half of those in in the Premier League is is incredible. And obviously the videos have, have took me back to. To them emotions that I probably felt then, so yeah, it's, uh, I'm just um, yeah, I'm really proud, and obviously um, along the way, I've found I nailed it on. Uh, not many lows, um, obviously once you get to uh, a good club like this uh, and the rise that we've been on, but obviously a lot of difficult challenges to to get here in the first place. So um, to reflect on that, I have never done. To to, to reflect a little bit now is. Um, it was really nice, yeah. Well, that was Steve Cook reflecting on his 300th appearance for AFC Bournemouth. The full interview is available on AFC BTV for free. Chris, what a servant he's been for the club and still continues to be for the club as well. Yeah, brilliant. Nice nice milestone for him this week and it was lovely to see him with those messages on the, uh, the club website as well. Check that video out if you haven't seen it already. But yeah, I mean, what a player he's grown into since he, he first came in in 2011. Um, on loan, of course, first of all, from from Brighton, having been on loan elsewhere and, and came down here and, you know, whatever they paid, was it 300 grand, I think? It was, uh, again, looks an amazing snip as so many of the Cherry squad are. But you think these days he, he's sort of propelled himself onto the brink potentially of England selection. Um, you know, he and Nathan Ake have formed a, a fantastic partnership. He's turned into a real leader as well in the absence of particularly Simon Francis in the last the last few weeks. He has the armband at times when Andrew Sermon isn't playing as well. Um, you know, he's a he's a, a much more rounded character these days. He's obviously a family man as well, which I think makes you know quite a big difference to players and and sort of happy in his life down here as well. So yeah, he's he really has made such progress. I think even over the last. I would say over the last six months, he's made fantastic progress either side of the summer, probably the back end of last year and the, the start of this year when he and Nathan Ake have become the, the first choice pair, if you like. Um, yeah, he, he's grown into a, a real asset for Eddie Howe and you know, one of the first names absolutely on the team sheet. And some really fond memories, of course, defensively, but also up front, he's been popping up with the odd goal against Liverpool last year and there was one against Fulham in the Championship as well that, that can't go unnoticed. Doesn't score tap in, Steve Cook, the overhead kick at Ipswich, if we go back a little bit as well to the, uh, the Championship days as well. Yeah, he doesn't get many tap-ins, I think of the last minute winner at Newcastle as well when he uh, powered in that header. So he's a very, very useful from set pieces. Um, and not always in the traditional central centre half, you know, with those headers. It's it has been sometimes the spectacular strikes like at Fulham, which uh, the one into the top corner, no one will no one will forget as well. So yeah, and as you say, the, the Liverpool goal in the four three, which was actually a great finish at the time as well. So yeah, it's, it's really useful to have somebody who can be contributing. You know, they might only score three or four a season, but those three or four. We've seen Nathan Ake bag three already this season. You know, they can be really, really important goals. Well, you mentioned Nathan Ake there. Him and, and Steve Cook, they've been brilliant at the back this season, haven't they? Yeah, it's, it's really grown into a partnership, you know, that, and again, they 
we think they're back to the Chelsea game, the last game here at the Vitality Stadium, where they had to deal with absolutely everything thrown at them for half an hour. You know, the concentration, uh, even you know later in the game as well, when Chelsea are looking to get back in it. Um, but to, it's hard to sometimes, un, well, it's hard not to underestimate how much it takes for for those guys with what they're dealing with with these top level strikers. You know, trying to keep an eye on Eden Hazard when he's in the, in in good form, and some would say he didn't have his best game here actually in that in that four nil with uh, you know got a bit frustrated. But that was because they they shackled him basically, and they they allowed him absolutely nothing so yeah now that the fact that you can now rely on Steve Cook and Nathan Ake to to keep clean sheets against the likes of Chelsea yeah it just emphasizes what a what a brilliant partnership they've built and Steve Cook he's one of only six outfield players to play every minute of the Premier League this season that's quite something isn't it it is in this day and age where the, the game is so physical and, and so demanding on the body and you know someone like Steve Cook will, will be in lots of physical battles he throws himself in for tackles and there's hardly anybody above him in the clearances and blocks statistics in the Premier League when uh, they come out he's always throwing himself in um, and you know he gets clout, you know he'll get a clout from Andy Carroll or somebody. So th these things they, they do take their toll. And you know you think of rugby players who can only play once a week because of the physical battering that their bodies take. Now I'm not saying Steve Cook is a rugby player, but what I am saying is that you know sometimes the fact that these players do manage to keep themselves on the pitch week in week in out for every single minute, um, it, it just shows the hard work they put in behind the scenes in the gym on the training ground, dedication uh, to make sure that they can perform at the top level every week. And it's worth mentioning as well for someone that's been here since 20 and as a centre-back as well, he's never got a red card for the Cherries. And that is a surprising statistic in a way because you, you see those moments in games where you know, somehow you'll need to pull somebody down or something for the good of the team or you, you see a rash moment. I think it, what it does show is that you know, he, he's got a cool head on him, really. Um, he doesn't get involved in flashpoints, really. Um, yeah, he's, he's passionate and of course he, you know, he'll, we'll see him hollering at people and hollering at the ref sometimes as well when things aren't going right. But he obviously knows how to keep a lid on it. Um, he... He has made mistakes. It would be, it would be, uh, I guess, remiss of us not to mention there have been some mistakes, but they've been ironed out pretty much. There's been maybe there's been one this season, but I think that was the part of his game where the difference between him being a very, very top defender and just a Premier League defender um, is that he's now ironed out most of those mistakes. And again, I think that comes with his maturity as a player and his decision making. And again, the hard work that he and Nathan Ake, along with the gaffer and Jason Tindall, who of course were centre-halves themselves, um, they talk of all that work they put in on the training ground. So it's, it's bearing fruit for sure. And you mentioned earlier he has had the armband a few times this season. He's got real leadership qualities, doesn't he? Yeah, I think he'd, he'd probably like to have it a bit more. Um, you know, Andrew Sermon is the club vice captain, which is why he has the band, armband on when, when he's on the pitch. Um, but I think Steve Cook is showing because Simon Francis, you know, with the unfortunate injury he's had and the age he's at, who knows how much longer he will be a factor in the Premier League team, hopefully for a long while yet. But Steve Cook, I would say, is certainly the, the captain in waiting, isn't he? Um, in terms of how he's matured. And I think his belief in his own game trans also transfers into that leadership as well. When you suddenly are confident and you can deal with what's being thrown at you, you can be an example to other people as well. And I think now that he's sort of has got himself as a top, top defender, um, he, he therefore can sort of allow that to rub off on others as a leader. And for someone that's that's been around for so long, he's still only 27 years old, so he could still have his best years ahead of him. Yeah, centre halves, you know, they often you see them in their mid to late 20s start to start to mature. Um, you know, the fact he spent so long here, he's been here for for eight years. It's going to be the, the most of his career. He's not going to be going anywhere anytime soon. I wouldn't think as long as the gaffer's here, then then Steve Cook will be here. Um, so yeah, from that point of view, he's, he's developed from. He's, he's a great success story, like Simon Francis, like Charlie Daniels, you know, Mark Pugh, who's now elsewhere. All of these guys who were started out their career and have gone the full journey here. Absolutely, a fantastic servant for the club. But next up for the Cherries is the trip to Anfield to face Liverpool. And back in 2017, it was quite a day. Let's remind ourselves. Let's have a touch inside. Lucas with the challenge. It's Wijnaldum. Wijnaldum's back pass is short. It's Benigafobe. And Bournemouth leads. It's a moment of calamity for Liverpool and Wijnaldum. But Benekafobe seized on the opportunity to net his fifth goal of the season and give Bournemouth the advantage after just seven minutes. And Alton just simply doesn't look. Bournemouth coming into this game in good form, 14th in the table, seven points above the relegation places. They know they are close to securing another season in the top flight. Here's Coutinho, it's Philip Coutinho. Liverpool have parity. Five minutes before the interval. The two Brazilians combining. It was direct, really. Firmino took the ball under control and Coutinho did ever so well. 
just to manipulate his body shape and maintain his balance before slotting the ball home. James Milner. Oh, he's been full of beans this evening. Juan Aldum. Juan Aldum inside the area. It's Juan Aldum who tees up Origi. And Liverpool leads. Well, Juan Aldum, who's horrendous error, gifted Bournemouth the lead after just seven minutes. Proves to be the architect for Liverpool on that occasion. It's beautifully crafted. And Origi. Had a simple finish. Yeah, body shape from one out of Just sells Wiltshire the dummy. Dangles the ball up to Origi. And it's two and two for the Belgian. Cook. Preparing for a long throw. That's inside the box. And Bournemouth do have the equaliser. With three minutes of the 90 remaining. Josh King could well have snatched a point for Bournemouth at Anfield. Just wasn't properly cleared. Clavin lost sight of the ball, lost sight of his man. Josh King just got the ball out of his feet and at such close range. It's a simple finish. Eddie Howe celebrates on the touchline. Well, the points shared at Anfield back in 2017, and it was Joshua King with the late equaliser on that day. Now, speaking of Joshua King, we have this Team of the Week card to give away in today's show. If you want to be in with the chance of winning it, then just comment below with your favourite Kingy moment, and we will pick a winner by three o'clock tomorrow afternoon. So make sure you get commenting on YouTube, and we'll be picking a winner tomorrow. Now, Chris, fond memories of that day back in back in 2017. Yeah, first result they they got obviously at Anfield as well. Um, having gone ahead and then suddenly find yourself behind, it's you th sometimes you can think, oh, well, we've lost the chance, it's gone. Um, and then Joshua King with that late equaliser. Um, I, I do remember actually very clearly because it being a you know sort of silence silence the ground on that occasion because Liverpool would expect. Uh, a couple of seasons ago to beat Bournemouth at home for sure. Uh, you know, that was the season with the 4-3 in as well. So that was, I guess that was Bournemouth's season so far against Liverpool, taking four points out of six uh, off them. Um, the last three meetings, of course, have been pretty difficult in the other direction. So, um, yeah, but that one, that day, Joshua King hit, I'm sure, sure scoring at the equaliser at Anfield will be, is a great moment for, for any player for sure. And this season we saw what Liverpool were all about here. Mo Salah got a hat-trick and uh, it was something uh, of a nasty wake-up call, wasn't it? Yeah, but then you think back to the first goal that shouldn't have stood. Um, you know, Salah was uh, was offside when that initial shot came in and he uh, tapped in the rebound, obviously. And then there was a couple of mistakes after that. And, you know, a team like Liverpool, in the form that they're in, um, are going to punish you. And they did. So, yeah, the last three games, I think it would be 4-0, 3-0 and 4-0. So and that, that doesn't always tell the story um, because that game could have been different. Um, but, yeah, Liverpool this season... Just lost top spot in the in the table, of course, to, to Manchester City a month ago. That people were, you know, putting the crown on their heads for uh, they won the title. So um, and Tottenham, of course, coming back into it as well now. So yeah, they'll be suddenly feeling a bit of the spotlight, having drawn the last couple of games. You know, drawing at home to Leicester, they would have had that down as as three. Um, and then you think, right, you've got to go to West Ham and make up for that, and they didn't manage to do so. You know, only got a point there as well. So I say only a point because a point away from home in the Premier League is a good result. But when you're you've got the, the quality of opposition on your coattails that like they've had, any sort of slip up um, can be crucial. So yeah, Bournemouth are going there. You know, ugh, people will say great time to go there. They've, they've not won the last two games. The other side of that is that they're looking to bounce back and they know that they're under a bit of pressure now. Um, but I know Eddie's a, a big fan of Jurgen Klopp and he thinks that they're, you know, they're, they're probably the best team in the Premier League of what we've seen so far this season. So even though they may not be sitting top of the pile at the moment. So yeah, uh, in terms of daunting fixtures, it's not that long ago since they played them here, as you say, in that 4-0. Um, yeah, it's, it's another tough one. And you mentioned Manchester City now top of the table after Wednesday night's win. How much will, will that play on Liverpool's minds going into the game? I think, I think well, it certainly tells them they're, they're, they're banging back in the title race of course that was City have played a game more so Liverpool still got the chance to, to re-exert their authority um, City playing that game early because of the League Cup final of course uh, in a couple of weeks time but yeah I think when you lose top spot and you've been in pole position and you've just slipped up a couple of times and you've allowed people back into it um, yeah they'll, they'll certainly be looking at where it's not happened for them but 
I, we have to look at the run before that one. I, I can't remember exactly how many, but it was something like eight or nine games in a row they won. So um, you've got to you've got to look at the form they produced before that and and know that it's they're going to have a little bit of a, a setback at some point. And if a setback is drawing two games, then you know that that's not a major setback in the grand scheme of things. But yeah, the, the key for Bournemouth is to go there with the Chelsea the Chelsea hat on, not the Cardiff hat on. And of course, the draws against West Ham and Leicester as well that can give them so much confidence going into the game, can't it? Um, well, it, for Bournemouth it can give them confidence that that, that uh, you know Liverpool might be on a bad streak and might have a bit of a hangover. Of course, Bournemouth have got lots of insight into the Liverpool camp with Dominic Solanke and uh, Nathaniel Klein, who of course isn't available this weekend. So from a team news point of view, you'd expect Adam Smith to go to right back and and probably Charlie Daniels to, to come back in as well, fresh from his his goal here against Chelsea, of course. Um, but yeah, I mean for Dominic Solanke, what a what a nice game to have in a way. He's just got back in the team here. Um, he'll want to go there, and I'm sure he'll probably show Liverpool fans maybe what they thought they would see from him. Uh, maybe it's a little bit early. He probably would have wanted three or four more games to get up to get up to speed with this team as well as get his sharpness up before he sort of goes back and I guess is on display at Liverpool. But I'm sure it would be a, a nice a nice one for him to, to be able to go back there. And, you know, Jordan Ibe as well. So Bournemouth have got a lot of Liverpool scouts in the, in their camp. Put it that way. And of course, going back to the start of December when they played Manchester City, they did a change of formation and a, a back five. Can you see anything like that going ahead this weekend? Possibly. Um, the only thing I'll say is that the, the formation has you know you think of the Chelsea formation. You know, it has sort of found its its. Uh, formula I guess in the last couple of weeks of course when you take Callum out and you take David Brooks out um, who seems to have been playing so well in that sort of more floating role as a, as a number 10 uh, that does give you one or two sort of different challenges but the way that the, the back five with Arta Boric in goal and, and obviously Klein at right back and Adam Smith at left back they, they've looked good as a back five from that point of view now you take Klein out of it this week and you play Adam Smith at right back there's an opportunity to potentially play three at the back and, and play wing backs. Um, you know, Chris Meppham, phew, what a place to come in and make your full debut if, if they decide to go three at the back with three three centre halves. Um, so yeah, there, there are options. Um, I just think that the, the, the formula has been pretty good recently um, with the back four. So I think if Eddie's happy playing the, the slightly tweaked personnel, then he would probably want to go that way if he can. And of course, you mentioned no David Brooks, no Callum Wilson, but what an opportunity it is for Dominic Solanke back where where he spent several years. Yeah, uh, only one goal on his on his CV at this level. Um, so yeah, it would be what a place to, to score for him. He scored on the final day of last season at Anfield, so he has scored there. He knows what it's like to score for the home team, which I'm sure obviously gets you a, about 40,000 more fans cheering for you than uh, if you score for the away team. But yeah, I mean, whether he would celebrate or not, I don't know. It's, it's a hard one to know because he's not Liverpool out and out, is he? He ended up there from, from Chelsea. But it is great that he's in the team. Um, and hopefully for Bournemouth fans, with Callum being out for you know the next two, three, four weeks maybe, um, they, need, they need Dominic Solanke to get himself up to to, to sort of match speed and, and start contributing a couple of goals, yeah. Absolutely, and well, it's going to be a really exciting game at Anfield. If you are going up, have a very safe journey. If not, make sure you keep an eye across all of our social media channels for the latest updates. Thanks for joining us.